Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lubov, for, for the nice invitation and for, for, for uh, you know, introducing me. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you guys. Um, so again, my name is Luca, and uh, I am a, a computer scientist working in Notobel Labs. Specifically, I work in the area of computational social science, which means that we take theories from the social sciences and we translate them, we operationalize them into algorithms and methods that we can later apply to uh, large-scale data, especially online data, to understand the human dynamics uh, a little better, right? So social relationships is one of the main focuses of my research, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So relationships are the single most important thing that we have in our lives. So that's something that we know and feel intuitively, but that's something that also has been uh, uh, shown by scientists. So we know that relationships uh, determine the diffusion of uh, innovations and ideas. Um, they determine the prosperity of communities, uh, even economic growth. They also prolong our lives and uh, determine to a large extent our happiness. So it's no wonder that uh, many researchers and especially you know, research in uh, network science is trying to predict these uh, very desirable outcomes out of uh, um, social interaction data, right? L Luca, your, your microphone yep. is a bit lower than uh, before. It's like the, the sound is, is could be a bit more up. Is there a way you can... Uh... Oh, that's a very good question. I can bring it closer to my mouth, <laughs> but um, I don't know if there is any... Yeah, that's better, actually. That's better. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll do like this. Hopefully, hopefully it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, uh, that's all fine and good, but uh, um, uh, one of the main limitations that we have in uh, current network science research uh, is uh, uh, the following. So when we model social interactions, we do it uh, uh, using uh, uh, graphs. There are simple, usually simple graphs where nodes are present here, people, and uh, weighted edges represent uh, the strength of connection between them. So now these models are fine because they're simple mathematical objects to work on. However, they um, fall short because they introduce one uh, um, inherent ambiguity that is the ambiguity of tie strength. So two ties with the same strength can represent actually two very different relationships. So I might have the same frequency of interaction with, I don't know, my parents and my spouse, but the type of interaction, of course, is very, very different, right? So what we would like to have in the future is something more nuanced. So to color social interactions um, using colors that represent the type of social connection between people. Uh, and this will, uh, of course, hopefully um, increase both the uh, predictive and the descriptive power of network models. So no, what I'm going to do and try to do today is to provide a solution to transition from this black and white world of weighted graphs to something more colored and nuanced, right? So the first question that I'm uh, going to try to answer today is uh, what are these colors about? So if we want to capture types of interactions, what type of types, what kind of types we should capture? And uh, to solve this problem, we adopt, uh, as, as we used to, uh, a computational social science approach. And we start from theory, um, especially from this theory that is called the, the social exchange theory. It's a very um, you know, popular theory in, uh, and well-studied theory in social sciences, uh, proposed for the first time by sociologist Peter Blau. And it's very complex, very articulated, but at the core of it, there is one simple concept. And this concept is that uh, any relationship can be described as a sequence of exchanges of some resources. These resources can be um, concrete resources, material resources like money exchange between people, but most importantly, uh, there are also non-material resources, such as the exchange of knowledge, of uh, appreciation, of uh, um, care and, uh, and affection, and so on and so forth. So what we want to do is to discover what are the fundamental resources that people exchange given this framework. So to do that, we approach, we, we follow the twofold approach. Um, so to, to answer this question, what are the type of resources, what are the colors uh, of links that we should focus on? The first thing we do is uh, a literature review. 
So, uh, of course, social scientists have worked for decades on this problem in identifying what are the fundamental blocks of uh, social relationships. But we don't stop there. We also complement this literature review with a crowdsourcing study. And that's a very simple study we conducted on Mechanical Turk, which is a platform commonly used for this type of studies. And we asked the workers on Mechanical Turk a very simple question to write down the words that best describe their social relationships with open ended uh, text fields. Right? Then, what we did is we counted the frequency of different words mentioned. And here is the representation of the top words. Um, and uh, these are responses from 200 people, and overall we have more than 300 unique words. As you can see, uh, the top ones are, for example, love, trust, fun, loyalty, respect, and so on and so forth. This is already very telling about uh, what people you know, care about and how they do conceptualize uh, uh, social relationships, uh, but of course it's very sparse. So what we did after this is we asked, uh, yet again, uh, crowdsourcers to pair these concepts by similarities and we built a similarity matrix, basically, that we can later on cluster in blocks uh, that uh, put, uh, uh, you know, close by rows or words that are semantically related. So here you see that, for example, you have the two main blocks of negative and positive concepts, negative sentiment, let's say, and positive sentiment. And then what you can do is to iteratively iter, um, cluster these, uh, these macro clusters to get the more fine-grained clusters. So now the... Um, uh, outcome of uh, this process uh, combined with the, the literature review yielded these uh, 10 macro dimensions or colors of social relationships, which I'm going to mention briefly. They're all very much understandable just by, by the name of them, but I'll, I'll just list them. The first is knowledge exchange. The second is uh, power, which is a power relationship between, for example, uh, uh, an employee and his manager, you know, from, um, um, you know, the, the king and uh, the people living in the kingdom. So things like that. Uh, status is uh, conveying uh, appreciation uh, to people. Um, so basically a granting status to others. Trust. Then we have social support, romantic relationships, similarity, which is expressing the similarity of tastes between people, identity, uh, a particular kind of similarity that focuses on, for example, racial identity or religious identity, fun and conflict. Okay. So these are the 10 colors that we want to focus on. And in principle, we want to extract these concepts from social networks. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, the uh, approach... Just Luca, there yeah, is one sure. question from, uh, of course, from yeah. Luba. Uh, yeah, 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 and yeah. she was asking if uh, for each type of relation, there can be several tags. Do, do you want to, to, to say uh, maybe Luba yes. what you meant? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, indeed, so every relationship is and can be um, composed by a combination of these concepts. So think about any of your friends. Uh, so do this mental exercise. Any of your friends at a high level, you can uh, describe your relationship with your friend as a, let's say, probability distribution of these topics, right? So yeah, maybe with a colleague at work, you have a relationship which is about knowledge, but also maybe fun and identity because you work in the same place, or maybe with your partner is about uh, support and romance, right? So we expect that different relationship will have a combination of these dimensions. Um, now we know that this exists, but now the problem is how do we uh, extract this dimension from network data, right? So I, ho I hope that this uh, answers the question. Um, so the, the approach that we want to follow here is uh, an approach that is focused on the analysis of uh, um, conversations, right? So we imagine that we can monitor conversations between people. So if we have a um, conversational exchange between these two lovely parrots, for example, um, and we have uh, an utterance and a response, uh, the first tasks that we want to tackle here is the following. So given these uh, pieces of text, we want to label these uh, messages with the, the um, dimension or possibly the multiple dimensions that uh, characterize this text. So in this case, we have the first message, which is about knowledge, exchange of basically factual knowledge. And the second one is giving appreciation to uh, another, so which means giving status in our framework, okay? So that's the first task we want to tackle, which is an NNP problem of mapping text 
to these 10 dimensions. And then another... Uh, just yep. be because yep, you sure. know you're going to dive into the 10 dimensions, uh, there was a question, and I think and I think several people would have the same. Uh, yep. Why 10? Uh, the, was there a specific threshold? Was there a specific yep. reason that 10 was the number uh, you ended up choosing rather than 9, 11, or...? Totally, totally. So this is uh, um, a combination between the two approaches. So from the approach in uh, the, the data-driven approach that we got from the crowdsourcing, we discovered those clusters and those clusters were, if I remember correctly, eight out of the 10 by using all the words that the people uh, uh, specified. So by clustering, by doing, for example, block modeling, but you can do other clustering algorithms it is pretty clear that the eight concepts are those eight. Then we uh, basically merged these eight concepts with other concepts that came from social sciences, from basically reading books and articles that are influential in social sciences. So the union between these two sets results into the 10. Now, uh, the question about, well, maybe there is an 11th. Uh, it's, I think, a fair question. Um, I don't think that this uh, model is... Uh, a uh, hundred percent exhaustive but think about it and uh, um, think about your own experience with uh, other people um, and think uh, whether these 10 dimensions don't define uh, maybe you know 90 percent of the nature of relationship that you have mm -hmm. it's uh, something that is uh, not a hundred percent comprehensive but still uh, defines uh, at a high level, of course, most of the relationships that people might, might entertain. And, according and, and to which, this combination which ones were the one, which ones uh, were yeah, the ones that yeah. were so not So let, uh, let me, let me go back. So the, yeah, so the, the two things uh, that basically were, so the, th the eight things that were fi found in, um, especially in literature, I think were all of these, except uh, fun and uh, not a lot about romance. Um, but uh, fun and romance were actually very prominent in the crowdsourcing and people didn't mention in the crowdsourcing, if I remember correctly, for example, identity, which is not strange because identity is a concept that is very uh, widely studied in, uh, in the social sciences, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think about other people, right? Oh yeah, so my relationship is about the fact that we share the same religious background. That's something that rarely comes to mind when people concept, conceptualize these things, which is, I think, interesting to, to study and to, and to uh, you know, uh, get from the data. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we want to do is to have a sort of uh, an, an overall all round uh, perspective that includes uh, possibly all concepts that matter from both perspectives. So, I hope that these uh, again answers. I'm not seeing it, the 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 yeah yeah other the the, the, the chat pop up. Yeah, the the chat pop up. I don't see it, but it's fine. So maybe yeah, you can maybe uh, raise my attention. I'll be, I'll be the one transferring the knowledge. Okay, from the chat. thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So these are the ten, probably not the only ten, absolutely for all type of interactions, but pretty exhaustive in a way. All right, so that's our uh, framework for assigning these uh, 10 labels to the to piece of text. The second task we want to do is also to label, as Liu was uh, basically also implying with your question, uh, assigning labels at relationship level. So let's uh, uh, assume that the part on the left says, oh, you know, my relationship with my friend is about knowledge, right? And so what we want to do here, here is to parse uh, possibly all the past communication that these two individuals had, and out of mining all their conversations, we want to predict the relationship level tie of knowledge, which is what basically the two people think about each other, okay? So these are the two tasks that I'm gonna try now to describe and solve. So to do that, we use a supervised approach of machine learning. Uh, and the thing is we have uh, in input a stream of text, whatever piece of text, we feed it into a black box machine learning uh, bit. And in output, we want to have a score or uh, 10 scores actually over the 10 dimensions. Again, here you can have two scores that are very high at the same time, because even in the same sentence, you can have the expression of two 
concept at the same time, for example, knowledge or trust, or identity and uh, conflict, for example, right? So this is not, is not mutually exclusive. Uh, now, the question is how we build the black box first, but also even before that, how do we collect training data to train the supervised model? So to solve the message level problem, so the labeling messages with dimensions, we turn out to Reddit. And the reason why we use Reddit is because it's uh, you know, openly available, it's a lot of data you, you can mine and use uh, you know, as a uh, as training set. So we collected 8,000 uh, posts and comments actually from Reddit, and that's a random sampling of uh, posts and comments from Reddit in 2017, from the full data set in 2017, uh, of course, focusing on English, uh, English text. And out of these uh, posts and comments, we basically highlighted random sentences inside the comment, and we shown these random sentences to crowdsource, to crowd, crowd workers, right? And we asked them to look at the whole piece of text and try to assign as many dimensions as they uh, deemed fit to the highlighted bit of the, of the sentence. For example, here we have uh, the highlighted part, which is, as a fellow introvert, you have my sympathy. And this is something that conveys both similarity, because uh, being uh, saying a fellow introvert means that there is the similarity between the, the two people who are talking, and social support, because uh, giving sympathy is social support. Of course, we needed to have a phase in which we trained the crowd workers to recognize these 10 concepts and have a lot of checks to check the quality of the responses, which took a little bit of time. But in the end, we labeled these 8,000 posts and had multiple labels, like five or more for each post, which allowed for majority voting, basically. Uh, so as uh, a result, uh, we so out of these 8,000, we noticed that 60% uh, of uh, these um, bits of text exhibit at least one dimension. And uh, this is the, um, the um, let's say, frequency distribution of the different dimensions. In Reddit, as one would expect, you have a lot of knowledge because that's what Reddit should about. Uh, also status, which is thanking people and support, and that's uh, expected because Reddit is a lot about also communities of support. And not surprisingly, also conflict, because social media, as we know, is also about the conflict a lot. Uh, other things are less frequent, but still we could find them. So that's fine. Uh, so we, we can do that. Now we can turn into the prediction task, because we have, uh, we have the... Um, the, the training data. So how do we train our black box model? So here we can adopt the two different NLP uh, approaches. The first one is the traditional one, uh, which is summarized with the boxes on the left hand side. So you can take a piece of text and extract all sorts of interpretable textual features, such for example, the sentiment of the text, uh, the topics that are expressed, uh, the punctuation, the formatting, and so on and so forth. Right? It's all interpretable features and feed them into whatever traditional machine learning uh, uh, framework, uh, such as XGBoost, uh, decision trees, whatever you like, right? And that's the part then number one. The second one is the uh, one on the right-hand side, which is the deep learning uh, framework. So uh, you abandon interpretable features and you describe each word uh, in an embedding space, for example, word to vec uh, so using basically pre-trained models. And then you feed this into uh, models like LSTM or BERT. Um, so maybe some of you are not too familiar with this, but uh, so it's, it's basically types of neural networks that take one word at a time in input and they update their states over time and they have also mechanisms to account for long-term dependencies between words in a sentence, right? Uh, and uh, these have been tested for you know, several different tasks and perform very, very well. So here I'm gonna show you the comparison between approach A, the traditional one, and approach B, the deep learning. And there so is here's a the question maybe yep. related, sure. uh, related to that particular aspect, uh, uh, and it's about the, the, um, the fact that some messages can be rooted in some context and some cultural norms that might be hard to know if they're direct or indirect uh, and not necessarily completely explicit. Uh, and so there was this question of uh, messages interaction rooted in context and cultures that are yep. subtle to or say one thing but mean another. Uh, and I know that you have a kind of a biased sample of the Turkers to begin with, 
So was the Reddit totally. from the same bias so that you basically are mainly focusing on that particular cultural context and here you will focus right. and, and you have it's, homogeneity for that? Yes, yes, it's an excellent question. So here we have two types of biases. The cultural bias is one and people might interpret different dimensions differently across cultures. This is not a cross-cultural study and we focus only on workers who uh, live in US and speak English. So that's, you know, main limitation of the usual uh, you know western uh, oriented type of uh, uh, data science work which is uh, on one hand very despicable <laughs> uh, but on the other hand uh, it's a bit easier to do at least for the first phases because there is more data available and uh, you know more opportunities also to label data more uh, carefully and uh, so th that's totally limitation the second limitation about the context around the utterance is partly solved by presenting the sentence that people have to label in the context of the whole post or the whole comment. It is true that ideally the context could be, so potentially the context could be even broader than just the single post. Uh, but in uh, platforms like, uh, like uh, Mechanical Turk, it's a bit hard to ask people to read a lot of text and make sense of a broader context. In most cases, the type of uh, resource exchange, the type of dimension is rather clear. For example, if I say, oh yeah, you are very smart, by definition, this is a status giving. Of course, uh, there might be irony, there might be you know, different caveats, which we don't account for as explicitly, if not giving the context uh, immediately around the sentence that has been, that has been labeled. So yes, so in principle, one could uh, collect more data that make sure to avoid all these uh, possible uh, um, pitfalls of, uh, of the labeling. So thanks for the question, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the, um, the results that I'm gonna show. Okay, so the results here, so here you see two colors, one for the interpretable um, uh, type of framework, the other one for the deep learning one. Uh, results are presented in terms of their AUC score. Uh, the AUC score is basically a score that measures the ability of uh, the, the, the machine learning framework to rank instances such as at the top of the ranking you have uh, a lot of positive ones and at the bottom you have a lot of negative ones, right? Um, and uh, the baseline for random classification is 0, 0.5, the perfect classification is 1, all right? So here we, you see two things. Usually the deep learning one is better than the interpretable one, right? Uh, which is sort of expected. The interpretable one doesn't do bad, but uh, consistently, almost consistently worse. And the second, I think very comforting thing is that uh, eight out of the 10 dimensions with the deep learning, past the sort of psychological threshold of 0 0.8 of AUC, which means a sort of a reasonable performance to apply these uh, tools uh, at large in, uh, in, a, in a certain way, right? So let's see here also. Um, okay, so another question we had about the specification of Reddit communities from which the text were mined. Uh, no, because uh, it was a random sample. So we randomly sampled the... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, there is a problem with your microphone. I think when you touch it, it made a big burst of sound that was uh, very, oh, very, very nasty. Loud. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. So, I, problem with audio, I'll try to be very, very still. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, thank you. No problem. Oh, I think you're touching. So, I think it's when you push your finger on the microphone. Oh, I don't know exactly. There was a strong noise. Yeah, aliens. Yeah, maybe it would be good to change. Any better? That's much better. Much better. That's much better. All right. Oh, oh, much okay. better. Sorry Thank for you. the inconvenience, guys. Yeah, very sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that's basically something that. Uh, we uh, we you know cheered about because it's a, it's a good performance in a way. Very good. So now uh, that 
thing solves uh, the problem of classifying uh, uh, individual messages, right? Which was the task one wanted to solve. And we saw, we saw that we can do it pretty um, accurately in a way. But what about the relationships, right? So we want also to classify uh, different uh, relationships. Um, uh, <laughs> all right, different relationships as perceived by people, right? So let's say that if uh, I think that a friend of mine, uh, the relationship with him is about knowledge, I want to infer this uh, knowledge label from uh, all our conversations. Now to do that, we need to collect a very different type of ground truth. Uh, and to do that, we took the long road. So basically we um, created from scratch a um, web platform that is called Tingy.org. And this web platform is a platform with simple games that people can play. Uh, each of these games has a different purpose, uh, and uh, the purpose for us researchers is to collect data uh, that are very hard to collect uh, otherwise with, uh, for example, crowdsourcing or uh, with, uh, with the common online sources. Now, uh, Tingy.org has a specific game uh, among uh, all these, so it articulates in different islands and you transition from one island to another. One of these islands is called the Isle of Ties. And the game is a very simple, uh, uh, silly game in a way. And it works like this. So you log in with your Twitter account. And uh, after you log in with your Twitter account, you are shown 10 of your friends. So here, for example, Romeo is shown the uh, profile of Juliet. All right, that's just an example, of course. Um, and then for each of your 10 friends, you are asked to describe the relation, your relationship with these 10 friends in terms of the 10 social dimensions, right? So for example, me and Julia, it will be, for example, about romance or other things, okay? So uh, in background and, of course, with the explicit and very clear consent of the people who participate, we also gather the conversations that happen on Twitter between these two people. So as a result of this effort, we have a bunch of messages going back and forth between the, the two people, and also, label, which now is not a message level labels, but it's a relationship level label. Let's see if we have a question here. Um, right, yeah, so maybe about context, we can maybe talk about it more in, in the discussion at the end. Okay, so, so as a result of this, we have this new training set at relationship level rather than at uh, uh, message level. And what we try to do is, again, to do this prediction by aggregating all the different messages. Here we have a training set about more than 5,000 relationships. And here the high level takeaway is the following, that we could predict with reasonable accuracy five out of the 10 dimensions, which are the ones that are listed on the left-hand side. And we notice that the number of tweets that you need to get an average AUC, which is around 0 0.7, which is a sort of reasonable, not excellent, but reasonable accuracy, is 20 tweets. So when you have 20 exchanges back and forth, you can sort of start to infer the type of relationship in a slightly more accurate manner, right? So of course here, a lot, a big margin of improvement for in terms of accuracy, but it shows that this process of inferring a relationship label from text, from a sequence of text, is actually possible. Okay, so this is basically the, um, the main uh, methodological, let's say, contribution. The next thing I'm going to talk about is how we can apply this framework to different contexts. To Just one question, Luca. Uh, when you talk about yeah. AUC, one relationship compared to all other relationships, uh, like the classifier that you do? So, uh, so, so it's not shown here. So in the paper, you can take a look at the details, but this AUC is an average AUC of all these five dimensions um, uh, against the number of tweets. Yeah. So for Twitter, I don't have the stats here in the paper, but there is uh, in the, so I don't, I don't have it in the slides, but in the paper, there is the uh, fine grained comparison if the people want to check it out afterwards. So uh, bottom line, of course, uh, it performs worse on Twitter because the framework is not trained on Twitter data, and so one would need fine tuning, uh, but you can adapt it to a certain extent. Yeah. So since this basically wraps up the methodological part, if we have maybe questions about this, uh, think about it and we can take them now. I maybe try to answer the, this context one. Um, 
of course, yeah, here are all excellent points uh, about, you know, special conditions, special populations, uh, um, biases, uh, all the work that we have done doesn't go uh, a tiny bit into that, because the first thing you need to know, you need to do is a model that works in, let's say, the best scenario of English tweets from Western countries, and by best scenarios, I mean the scenarios for which we have more data to work on, and it's uh, you know easier also to model the NLP on. It is totally true, and I completely 100% uh, uh, subscribe uh, to that uh, point of view, that we need to stop limiting our analysis only to the usual uh, US-based English tweets. Totally agree. Uh, of course, it takes more time and more research to do that, but it's something that we are actually genuinely committed to do. And this summer, we are starting actually looking at how to translate these things, for example, in, in Spanish. So, so yeah. So are emoticons processing the analysis of text and tweets? Uh, yes. Um, so it depends. So, but yes, in both cases. So for the interpretable uh, uh, framework of machine learning, you do have features that encode the emojis or emoticons. Uh, also in the um, intrinsically in the deep learning framework, what you do is uh, um, basically map also emojis, for example, in an embedding space, and this count as uh, tokens, uh, any other token, so like a word. And so you will be able to learn dependencies between uh, emojis, emoticons, and uh, other elements of the phrase in relation to the dimension that the phrase expresses. So yeah, so I think that um, more or less we answered all the questions so far, but yeah, keep, keep uh, others in mind as we progress. So now, second part of the talk, which is gonna be about applications. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is to try to validate this approach on several uh, new data. And we want to do this in three main contexts, right? So the first one is the dyadic context. So uh, having individuals that talk to each other in a dyadic setting and see how our uh, framework performs there. The second is the group context. So when you have uh, an organization, for example, or a group of people, how can we leverage this uh, algorithm to, to understand more about groups. And the last one is about a societal level. So if we apply this to this framework to very large populations, for example, like nations or countries, um, how, what can we learn from, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example for each of the three groups. For dyads and groups, it's gonna be more of a qualitative assessment of what we can do, whereas for the societal one, we'll have also some predictive experiments, all right? And it's supposed to be also a bit, you know, uh, more uh, fun uh, to show you some fun uh, applications. So the first one for the dyadic level is based on movie scripts, right? So movie scripts uh, are great for NLP because they uh, contain a lot of prototypical types of uh, uh, human interactions, right? Because the scripts, of course, des describe um, the, the type of, of uh, archetypical um, uh, interaction that people that people have also in real life, right? So there is this very nice uh, uh, data set from Cornell uh, that lists, uh, I think, uh, scripts from, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, several hundred thousand of, of, of movies. And you can, you know, freely use it and use it for money. It's a very recent uh, uh, corpus that you can check it out. So what we did is we apply our method to all the scripts uh, that were present there, and we ranked the top uh, exchanges between uh, uh, movie characters uh, for different dimensions. And I'm gonna you know, present them now uh, for the sake of you know, having a bit of fun together. So I hope that you can recognize this movie. So uh, maybe some younger people in the audience know the new versions of the franchise. But this is Star Wars uh, episode six, uh, back in, I think, 1981. And uh, this is an exchange between Obi-Wan Kenobi and uh, the pupil, Luke Skywalker. And this is the textual exchange, right? So the master is uh, uh, basically teaching something to the apprentice and warning him about uh, an impending threat in a way. So when we apply our framework on this specific sentence, this is the distribution of uh, dimensions. So here, those that uh, come to the top are knowledge and power, which is basically a transfer of knowledge in a, a teacher to pupil type of relationship, so a power relationship. 
and also talks about conflict because it's about uh, Luke being uh, um, destined to confront uh, the evil of, of uh, the opponent, of the villain in the movie. Right? So that's just one example. So let's go to the next one. This is uh, uh, probably many of you know this, Godfather part two. That's the sentence. So Frank, you're a good old man and be loyal to my family for years. So I hope you can explain what you, what you mean. So here, uh, Il Padrino, the Godfather, Michael Corleone, is, uh, uh, according to our tool, expressing appreciation where, where towards the other men. It's uh, giving status. You are a good man. And also trust. You've been loyal to my father for years, And so I want uh, some explanation for you. Right? Of course, again, here, the broader context of the movie is not taken into account. But if you look just at this sentence, this conveys, according to the algorithm, status and trust. Another popular example. Um, uh, so 2001, um, here we have the robot, uh, HAL 9000, that is trying to communicate with the, with the astronaut saying, look, Dave, I know that you're sincere, you're trying to do a, a good job uh, and trying to be helpful, but I can assure the problem with this specific unit is with your test gear. And here, uh, the, um, uh, the tool detects um, a mixture of knowledge and support, which in this case is basically technical support. So giving support about, uh, you know, a technical domain. Last example, uh, very uh, easy and very effective, I think. Uh, this is uh, Star Trek, um, uh, Wrath of Khan, the second movie. And uh, here is basically about identity, the identity of an alien that is saving his, uh, his uh, own crew. So let's see if we have a, a question. <laughs> Ali is actually lying, exactly, and so that's uh, why I'm saying uh, um, that, uh, of course, the, the broader context here and irony is not taken into account, and so that's what makes uh, this example particularly funny, I guess, uh, but, you know, at face value, that sentence uh, could seem about basically giving technical support. Okay, so that's, you know, just a, a little funny example that I wanted to present to you to uh, show you that we can monitor these dyadic relationships in a quite, uh, uh, you know, a detailed way. So second example, at group level, uh, I wanted to focus on another qualitative study about Enron. Probably some of you are familiar with Enron. Enron is, uh, used to be a company that worked in the field of uh, energy, supposedly. It was a company in the U.S., uh, very well known for its uh, very creative financing that brought it to uh, basically to the default uh, at the end of 2001. Okay, so as a result of the investigation around the company, all the uh, records of email exchanges for the last year were published, and uh, they've been used by several researchers to do text mining research. Right. So we did the same, and we applied these ten dimensions to the stream of uh, emails flowing between employees and try to relate them with the different phases of the company. So here you have a bit of a summary of, uh, for example, the, uh, oopsie, the Z-score, so which is uh, basically the variation uh, in terms of standard deviation over the mean of the sentiment, here is just sentiment, basic sentiment analysis of the emails from October 2000 to October 2001, or maybe November, right? And here what you can see is a steady decline of sentiment, so going from positive sentiment to negative one. So here there are four phases marked on the plot, uh, which are known phases of uh, this company. The first one is when the initial concerns about the financing of the company were disclosed back in January. Then we have uh, layoffs uh, conducted, um, uh, then uh, subsequent financial losses, and at the end, uh, bankruptcy. Uh, so the, 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 it was a default of the, of, the, of the company, right? So here we can see these four events but a steady decrease of sentiment. So now let's see if we can add more nuances when we apply the 10 dimensions. So here we have, the, let's say, the three major phases, concerns, layoff, and bankruptcy, and losses. Let's see how these relate to the 10 dimensions, or you know, five of the 10, because, for example, other like identity or romance didn't show up in the, in the analysis. So here, for example, in the first phase, when the first initial concerns were published, uh, people stopped giving uh, uh, support to each other. So basically, everyone on his, on, was on his own. And uh, the status, basically thanking and congratulating each other, was something that was not done anymore. Uh, after the layoffs, or actually right before them, what we have is a drop of knowledge. So people don't talk about work anymore. 
a drop of power, so the power structure of the company collapses completely because, uh, of course, there is no incentive to, to work if the layoffs are impending, and uh, a spike of conflict. And then at the end, so after, these, uh, uh, after the, the layoffs, people started to give support to each other, and also right before the, the last days, people basically gave support in the wake of uh, uh, basically destruction of the company. So let's see if we have a comment about this. Oh yeah, so the sentiment. Sentiment is just a baseline, uh, and here the parenthesis that says Vader uh, is the name of the tool that we used. Sentiment analysis is uh, just a very simple word matching uh, type of approach that gives a score in between plus one and minus one to a sentence, where plus one means uh, absolutely positive sentiment, something very joyful, to absolutely negative sentiment, like uh, something dreadful and of conflict, the people insulting each other, right? What we can see here is that at the very beginning, very positive sentiment, at the very end, very negative, like one would expect. But we don't see all these nuances and nice phase transitions that uh, we can see from the one once analysis of the ten years. But thanks for the question. I didn't, I didn't actually specify it. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the last bit, which is uh, uh, the societal level analysis. And for this, we focus on uh, the conversations in the United States. Let's see if we have a. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, um, so, what we did here is we mined very large scale conversations from several states in the US, and we tried to relate the type of discussions people are having with the outcomes that are measured at census level in different states. So let me try to detail this a little bit more. So we focus on Reddit. Again, why Reddit? Because Reddit is nowadays one of the very few uh, sources that you can access openly with a lot of data. You can go in the past to mine data in the past, which is not possible with Twitter. Uh, so we picked this, uh, this source. And out of Reddit, we could extract a list of uh, uh, people in Reddit who live in the US. And we could extract exactly the state in which these people live or have lived for a long time. So then, given the, the map of US, for each state, we can estimate uh, or you know, basically identify sets of users living in different states, which amounts to um, roughly 15 mil uh, 14 million users and uh, uh, 800 plus million comments, okay, overall uh, throughout the US. And this, I think, refers to one year only, which is the year of 2017, okay? We could have done for more, but we did just for the other thing. Now, uh, given this uh, setting in terms of, uh, of data, we formulated three hypotheses uh, motivated by previous research in computational social science, right? The first hypothesis is that uh, knowledge, a high exchange of knowledge within a country, should relate to higher education levels. This is something pretty straightforward to think about. So if people in a certain state talk about a lot of uh, factual knowledge, it means it might indicate that the average education level is higher than other places, okay? Pretty straightforward. Second hypothesis is that uh, knowledge, high level of knowledge, leads to high income. So uh, basically higher wealth in the country. And these, there have been many, many studies that try to relate basically exchange of knowledge and ideas and recombination of ideas with the uh, wealth of a country. And I cited just one, which is at Amazon and Bettencourt and other people, but uh, there is plenty of uh, research on this. And third one, a bit more daring, uh, is the relation between high presence of social support and higher prevalence of suicide per capita. This is a little bit counterintuitive if you think about it, uh, you know, just at uh, the beginning, but there is a lot of research in computational social science that shows that uh, basically people who cannot get support in real life from the com community and the family surrounding them they turn to online media to search for the support, right? So the higher prevalence of people asking for support and discussing support means that there is an underlying uh, distress of the population and that this has been shown in several pieces of work. So we expect that higher support relates to a negative outcome in this, uh, in this respect. 
So to test this, we uh, used a very simple uh, linear regression, a regression that includes uh, basically the average level of uh, every dimension exchanged in the country. And we control by population density, which is, uh, you know, in all urban studies and geographical studies is uh, something that uh, is always used to predict whatever outcome because the denser uh, the population, the more cities and, and uh, metropolis, metropolitan areas are in the country, the more you can predict about uh, all sorts of social economic outcomes. So that's the control variable. And then we have our 10. So I'm going to show you very briefly the um, coefficients for each of the hypotheses and the outcome in terms of adjusted R square. So here, for, for example, is the hypothesis about uh, these dimensions predicting education levels uh, measured at census level. The bold uh, um, coefficients are the statistically significant ones. And uh, here at the bottom, you see two numbers. Um, 0.078 is the adjusted R square of the full model. And this plus 52 means the improvement of, uh, of the, the full model over a model that uses only population density as a predictor. Basically, it's the improvement over the population density, population density baseline. Um, as you can, we can see here, we have a positive coefficient for knowledge, negative for conflict that predicts education. For wealth, again, it's very similar, but we also add a negative with similarity, which hints at the fact we did, we cannot prove it, but hints at the fact that uh, environment in which you have uh, diversity of ideas, so basically lack of similarity, are um, uh, more, uh, you know, are, are environment in which ideas spread in a more, you know, fruitful way, which is something well known. And for the last one, for suicides, we see that indeed we have a positive coefficient, very high for support. So the more support, the higher the suicide prevalence. We have also negative coefficients with identity and trust, which actually posteriori makes sense. We didn't hypothesize it, but uh, when uh, people feel surrounded by you know, a lack of trust and they don't have a strong identity, especially when we're talking about teenagers, and that's very well known in social psychology, suicide rates tend to be, to be high. Right? And the R squares are remarkably high for all the models if you, if you look at them. Uh, this is just a plot that shows you know, some trends with just one predictor. For example, education predicted with just using knowledge or suicide predicted just looking at support, which already shows the trend without using all the 10 dimensions. Okay, so that brings me to the end, even because it's very late. So uh, as a summary, so we introduced 10 dimensions to describe how people can conceptualize their relationships. We show that uh, people express the dimension in language and, and at the, that NLP can capture these dimensions and that we can uh, uh, link these expressions to outcomes, to community outcomes. So what I hope that we can do in the future as a natural science community is to try to transition, transition from black and white models to nuanced models, like the one that I have uh, uh, presented to you, to have uh, you know, a type of analytics that goes beyond the usual rhetoric of the tie strength and colors the ties in a way that is uh, uh, not only more predictive, but also more meaningful and uh, uh, explanatory uh, in terms of qualitative analysis. So, of course, this is a collaboration that has been uh, going on for several years now. Um, and the, the piece of work I described is just, you know, the last pinnacle of, of this collaboration. So I thank all the people who participated in this effort from nowadays from several different uh, institutions. Uh, these are four of the papers that led to the, this last contribution, which is this uh, uh, WWW paper, the web conference paper presented the last month um, at the conference. If you want to take a look at the two relevant websites, uh, are these ones at the bottom. Uh, the first one is the project page. The second one is Tingular.org, which is the um, gaming platform I was describing. So thank you very much for the patience. Very sorry for you know, uh, the audio problems. And uh, I think uh, I can start answering maybe questions in these few last minutes. Um, maybe starting from the one that we have uh, here. So I guess it was about the models. So saying from the similarity negative data, um, uh, is not also related to high wealth. Uh, yes, it could be. Yeah, it could be a uh, basically indicator of uh, imbalance or unequal communities. This could be 
could be. Uh, uh, so we can hypothesize many things, of course, uh, um, then verifying them with facts, it's, uh, with measurements is a bit uh, harder, but it's uh, definitely a good, uh, a good interpretation. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's great. Uh, well, yeah, first, are there any other questions? Exactly, yes. First of all, thanks. Uh, the, the talk was really wonderful. Uh, if you have other questions, you can actually unmute yourself if you want to ask. Yeah, right, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but maybe, maybe I'll start. Uh, it's really good because you have really provided a ground uh, uh, for, for exploring these dimensions and you have a good setup now to actually go and explore the, the causal rules. So you have this correlation at the end, which is already super informative. Uh, and I wonder if you're going also to explore a bit more like causal processes. So for example, uh, in, in knowledge transfer or in the process of communicating some things, if this is a conflictual type, it you know, uh, doesn't lead to the same consequence in terms of chain of communication after that if it is a trust or, you know, so depending on the oh, type. Yeah. I, uh, and I think that's where you're going into the future, which is you have a multiplex and you will have different types of works or different types of rates of activation depending on the ties. Uh, is it something where you see that you have some kind of data where you're going to explore that or are you going to continue on, on, on what you've been exploring with your data sets already on Reddit? Yeah, so no, it's an excellent question. So uh, in the future, what we plan to do is uh, to revisit several networks, uh, temporal networks and spatial networks. For example, Twitter Twitter and Reddit are two very good sources because you, can, you have a lot of data and you can have uh, for Reddit uh, basically a complete network. For Twitter, you know, a uh, huge stream of data and you can look at these things over time. And uh, I'm not very much fond of, you know, usual... Uh, Causality, causal inference mechanisms uh, with historical data. So it's, uh, I think, a good exercise, but it does, I don't think it adds a lot on what we have already. But I think that your point goes more into studying temporal dynamics of things that, you know, uh, come before and after certain events. Uh, so one main question that I have is, for example, how a single relationship evolves over time. So what is the sequence? of uh, dimension that create a certain type of human relationship that then that can then result into positive outcomes uh, at any level so definitely we would like to revisit uh, structural theories in network mm -hmm. science and also uh, temporal uh, temporal phenomena uh, which uh, ranges from information diffusion to other temporal phenomena that we can uh, we can uh, you know have on networks in the light of the 10 dimensions uh, because I suspect, and we have already some evidence of uh, recent work we have been doing, not yet published, that by focusing on, uh, for example, the network of knowledge rather than just filtering by weight, you can get much more predictive power for uh, classical uh, network science problems. Yeah. And on, on, on that note, and, and just to finish on that theme, uh, so there was a lot of were a lot of questions related to you know intended uh, uh, um, intended. Uh, relation or intended type of relationship and perceived uh, because some things that can be intended to be i don't know romantic can be perceived conflictual or whatever it is there could be a difference in in in, in intended tie uh, and perceived tie and especially also in the perceived ties there can be a, a fatigue that if somebody is always speaking with a certain type of language that is i don't know like trust based or put emojis all the time etc you might perceive that more as more and more as normal and not as high balance in one of those categories because it's repeated. Uh, and I don't know if that's something also that is fine grained yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. So I think that the, the um, intended versus perceived, it's a very good uh, topic. I invite all of you to take a look at this um, excellent paper that's been published uh, uh, in the same conference we presented this one, uh, this paper um, from, uh, from uh, Christian Danescu, uh, so uh, um, an expert, uh, one of the world experts in NLP, who is trying to, who has tried to uh, use NLP tools to differentiate and distinguish between intended um, meaning and perceived meanings of different utterances. Very fascinating work you should read, and that's something we definitely could, uh, could work on, yes, yes. And then maybe quickly I try to answer also uh, these couple of other questions. Uh, Let's see. Oh, yeah. So there was another one here. So 
uh, here is about the bridge between, for example, knowledge transfer and other type of outcomes. For example, innovative projects, uh, concrete actions. Uh, is there a um, uh, you know ideal medley of all these dimensional factors that lead to things that we would like to promote? Yes. So that's exactly the next step about this project, and to understand. So, given a, an outcome that we care about. Uh, it could be, you know, innovation, uh, could be whatever, uh, giving effectively support, could be even, you know, prolonging life of people, giving support to certain communities. What is the, the blend of dimensions and uh, um, actions uh, in terms of uh, social interactions that one should follow to maximize the outcome? And this, I think, there is a lot of research in social sciences about uh, the perfect blends on how to reach uh, good outcomes. But these have, be, have never been shown in uh, large scale data because there was no way to measure these blends. Right? So, your comment, uh, Alina, is uh, very much uh, spot on. And that's something that uh, basically entails uh, future work we are planning to do. Yes. That's great. Uh, let's take maybe the uh, last question that I see mm -hmm. up here. Uh, so, I mean, okay, so what about the nature of relationships? Um, Yeah, so I should say something. So in the classification, basically, so uh, as you've seen also from the from the um, crowdsourcing study, these concepts, all the concepts, were um, uh, expressed both as presence and lack of. For example, uh, unloving was a, um, a word that was very frequent in the crowdsourcing, which means lack of love. Right. So all these dimensions, in a way, could be perceived as a presence of that or a lack of that. For example, knowledge versus uh, stupidity. Right. So now there is not an obvious way to compute the lack of directly from the framework. Um, but uh, um, of course, at a population level, you can compare trends. Right. And you can see, oh, the level of knowledge exchange is higher than a certain baseline. And there you can try to estimate the lack of. Uh, but this is definitely a good point. So both the positive and negative aspects should be accounted. And very quickly to also uh, answer to Alexei, if you go to this link, the first link, the socialdynamics.net slash 10 dimensions, you will see just a little form that you have to fill in uh, just you know, to keep track of people who are interested in these type of topics. And then you will be given a, a GitHub link where you can download the tool. And the tool, you, it's uh, maybe a little tricky to set up at first, but there are instructions there. You have to download uh, basically the different language models. It's a bit, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe time consuming a little bit, but you can run it on your own. So it's public and open sourced. So please do and let me know if you like it and what should we improve. Yes. 